uh, why a session on Max Klackmann? What struck me in recent years as I was more exposed to anthropological traditions was their divergence. Anthropology, even in our globalized world, takes on different forms according to place. Perhaps when you come from the margins of the Middle East, this is more evident. Who do we follow, the American or the British tradition? Both clearly are molded by, molded by their past intellectuals and fields of inquiry. In other words, contemporary anthropology emerges from the foundations. Therefore, exploring one's academic roots may also reveal the undercurrents of our present preoccupations. It's evident that many anthropologists in Israel sense this, as only recently two works on the history of Israeli anthropology were published, one by Orit Abouhav and another by Moshe Shoked. And there are other earlier explorations, such as the introduction to the book edited by Abu Havert, so Goldberg and Marx, or the history of research on Palestinians published by Dani Rabinovich. As part of this reassessment of our academic heritage, this session explores the, the vital role of Max Glackman. Glackman's work is still present in Israeli anthropology, in discussions of modernizing processes, rituals of inversion, customary law, Glackman, as we will shortly learn, was a major figure that fashioned Israeli anthropology during the 1960s. However, we should bear in mind that there were other sources of influence. Anthropologists such as Henry Rosenfeld and Alex Weingrode, who came from different backgrounds and with other ideas, and more will be said on that by Immanuel Marx. It seems that local anthropology was somewhat like its environs, a melting pot. Max Glackman would have been happy to learn how many people were enthusiastic to talk about his legacy? First and foremost, I wish to thank Peter Glackman, Max son, who offered many initial leads, expressed his support by sponsoring the Max Glackman Prize to the winner of the MA competition, and came from London especially for this session. And I also want to say thank you very much to the Glackman family. Some of the members are here, and especially thank you to Yael. Another special thank you to Robert Gordon, who is currently writing a biography on Max Glackman, and willingly agreed to come from afar, South Africa, to share his knowledge. And of course, thank you to Bruce Kapferer for preparing yet another lecture for his visit. Bruce was a student of Glackman, later a teacher at Manchester, and published a book on the Manchester School. Immanuel Marx was also extremely generous, guiding me to people and topics, saying yes to every request. Last but not least, thank you to Don Handelman and Moshe Shoked, who gracefully gave their consent to prepare a paper for today's session. The stories that these scholars have so far told me reveal Glackman both as a deep thinker and a very special personality. It is with much, much anticipation that I'm happy to open this session and invite Professor Robert Gordon to be the first speaker. Well, uh, first of all, thank you. This is my first visit to Israel. It's been a hell of a cultural experience. I've been totally overwhelmed. And let me start. This paper is not going to be up to the standard of several of the papers I've heard so far. So it's also very much in a developing form. So I would welcome feedback and exchange of ideas. Um, <clears throat> What I want to do since the prize is being awarded to graduate students is focus on Max's early fieldwork in Zululand. And I'm particularly interested in how his essay, The Analysis of a Social, Ch Social Situation in Modern Zululand, and its sequel, Some Processes of Social Changes Illustrated from Data from Zululand, uh, was written. And these essays, I think everyone agrees, are paradigm setting for the Manchester School. And in it, in Max's own words, he showed how individuals in certain key positions could create and exploit social situations in terms of their power and their culture, and yet how certain other processes arising from the larger society led to standardized but unplanned relationships and associations. <clears throat> and this essay, or these two essays, have generated a lot of interest. There have been several attempts to explain how they got written. Uh, the most recent one ha explanation has Max uh, just coming out of the field and then getting a copy of uh, Lucy Mayer's Methods of Study of Culture, which has Malinowski's introduction. And the story is Max got so irritated at Malinowski that he wrote 
the, the bridge essay. Um, and Max himself, in various of his autobiographical essays, says that this was one factor, but it's much deeper than that. And I don't think we can have simple, single causal explanations for this. Um, in another essay, he says, oh, he was just bored by library work and he wanted to get into the field. Um, of course, there's a story behind that. One of the reasons why he couldn't do library work is the South African, the Chief Native Affairs Commissioner, essentially limited his, restri his access to the archives, so he couldn't do library work, so he was forced into the field. Uh, the other explanation which he gives is, of course, Bateson's Naven and schismogenesis as being a factor. And all these explanations for how it came to be written are probably correct, but they're only partial. And I want to sort of delve a bit deeper into how the bridge came to be written. And of course, first of all, we've got to look at the road to Zululand. Why Zululand of all places? Why chiefs? And when Max was a student in the 20s, it was an exciting time to be involved in this discipline called Bantu studies. Uh, the Afrikaans language universities were obsessed with the poor white problem. The English language universities were involved in the mistermed native problem, which should be the white dilemma, I think is much more accurate. And Max's courses, which he was doing at WITS, focused on this. He studied with Reinhold Jones. In 1927, there was an important piece of legislation called the Native Administration Act, which made the Governor General the supreme chief of all the Africans. And this wonderful invention, which was essentially a way to extend colonial control and internal pacification, uh, was centered on the model of Shaka. And Max was very acutely aware of this. In 1932, you have the Native Economic Commission, which focuses on the chief. Um, and in fact, if you look at Max's 1933 honors thesis, it's on the role of the chief. Uh, he says he wanted to study contemporary aspects of it, but being such a bibliophile, uh, he didn't have time to do that. It's 158 pages long. It's quite interesting. But if you look at this, you'll see he's totally a Malinovskian. Um, the chief is a sort of clearinghouse for economic energy. To and from flowed the constant stimulus of social energy. Um, and then, of course, he was also heavily involved in student politics. Not only was he secretary of the Student Representative Council, he was heavily involved in USAS, the National Union of Southern African Students. He was involved in running the Bantu study circles. All the universities had groups studying the native problem, and Max was involved in that. And then as he was getting involved in this, um, the student Christian movement went and had a conference in Fort Hare, and horror of horrors, they had a mixed rugby game. And the Afrikaans press went ballistic about this. So of course, the next thing at the next Nusa's conference uh, someone proposes that Fort Hare be admitted to NUSAS. The Afrikaners go ballistic. No, you can't do this. Being good bureaucrats, what do you do in a situation like this? You appoint a commission of inquiry. Max is on the commission of inquiry. Um, that sort of inquiry doesn't becomes null and void because the Afrikaners decide to secede from NUSAS and create the Afrikaner Studentenbund which is the front for the Bruderbond, which plays a major role in the formulation of Bantu policy as it was then known. Um, this is important because one of the key players in this was an Afrikaner anthropologist called P.J. Skuman, who Max met in Zululand later on, and I'll come back to that. Uh, so he was heavily involved and acutely aware of the issue around the chief, and so Max goes off to Oxford he does, his, does the first D fill at Oxford under Merritt on the realm of the supernatural amongst the southeastern Bantu. Um, and what is interesting is no one reads this, and it's only perhaps its only claim to fame is it was notoriously plagiarized by the Reverend W. T. Shropshire, who used it to do a book on Christian missions in Africa. And what is interesting, and I think this is important, is Given the wide definitions of what constituted ritual, he opted to focus instead on the ritual situation. Since rituals get their significance in the situation they are in the acted, undoubtedly an important precedent to the bridge. So I think 
is coming from is coming to the bridge from a very strong ritual uh, perspective. He's also at Oxford. He meets up with Evans Pritchard and Maya Fortes, and they start moving, if you will, into opposition to Malinowski. Um, I think that the papers which Malinowski critiqued in the Mayor volume, uh, the problem there is Malinowski critiqued everyone except Audrey Richards. So I don't think that quite holds. And I think this <coughs> later on, Max sort of took this up with these forwards and introductions and prefaces to various of his students' works. He wasn't scared to critique them. Uh, Zululand, of course, played a major role because of Shaka, this larger-than-life figure. Um, it plays a very strong role in the white South African imagination, um, the black Napoleon, etc. You have all these, so even the Afrikaners thought Shaka was the greatest. Um, Oliver Walker, a journalist who goes to Zululand at about the same time as Max, describes it as the Department of Native Affairs as zoological showplace. He describes the shabby paganism. Um, and he also notes, and this is important for understanding what happens later on, the air of suspicion that surrounded local Europeans. You didn't just drop in for a casual chat. He also points out that the place was overrun by white planters. And here again, another interesting little sideline. Uh, Evans Pritchard's wife, was the daughter of the member of parliament for Zululand, um, something which I have to go into. Anyway, not only was the bridge an important essay, but Max's Zululand experience was important because it's the first case of an anthropologist getting banned from doing field work. And I think this is very, very important for understanding what was going on. Um, and the reason for this is, unlike Malinowski, who lived in a tent. Max lived in a kraal, and he started wearing on occasion a bear shoe, which is a traditional Zulu garb. And he tried to live on local diet, which wasn't a very good thing to do. He had to go up to Joburg for <laughs> medical treatment periodically because it screwed up his stomach something badly. Um, and there are se several accounts of why he was banned. Max never really wrote about it. He mentions it in passing in different ways. Uh, in the version which Max writes about, he says, oh, the Zulu regent was having a conference in Freyheit to report back on the Native Representative Council, and there was a drunk guy who said, shouted out, you know nothing, you know nothing. And Max had this ethical question, should he intervene or let the situation flow and capture valuable ethnographic data. Max decided to take the ethical way out and intervened and the region got really upset about this and apparently their relationship plummeted but as the native commissioner said if he hadn't intervened he'd have been kicked out anyway so he basically had no choice. Um, so we have that and then we have in 1939, Max gets money to go back to Zululand, and Agnes Winifred Hernley, his mentor and big mentor at Witz, writes to the Secretary for Native Affairs to say, can Max come back? And the Secretary for Native Affairs writes to the Chief Native Affairs Commissioner in Zululand and says, what's the situation? And so the officials go and interview the Regent, and he says, I don't want him here. He was here long enough before. I've learned that he wears a bear shoe at times when out at Matulana's kraal. I do not like Europeans who want to live in native kraals. He is always asking people how they are treated, if they are overtaxed, whether they are oppressed, and whether the chiefs and indunas like the feeling of being under European rule. I think he's working for someone undisclosed. In fact, the man may be a communist whom we are warned against. Um, he also asks questions about which are too intimate regarding our sexual customs. And of course, the local police sergeant says, I have to inform you that although I have nothing against the applicant, I do not consider it advisable for him to, for him to have permission to mix with the natives. He is pro-Russian and he does not know the native and his work amongst them would only tend to make the native believe that his way, that his was the, that he was on the same or higher plane as the European. Um, the acting native commissioner also says, yeah, well, the guy's a bit of a, 
He's an atheist, uh, but you know, he should be allowed to continue. But the Chief Native Affairs Commission says, I don't want this dude here, no ways. And so the Secretary of Native Affairs says, okay, we won't have Max come back. Um, Max is, one of the more interesting things about Max is there's this absolutely fantastic unpublished manuscript called Cohesion, Conflict and Cohesion in Zululand, which is a manuscript I date to the mid 40s. I think he was going to try and submit it to um, um, what was the um, anyway an American publisher because Wolf Sachs his psychoanalyst and friend had suggested that he do it um, and what is interesting is right in the second chapter he's got a set the first chapter is basically a reprise of the bridge the second chapter is 80 pages long and it describes the fieldwork situation um, and Max at this stage is having some interesting issues. He writes to uh, Maya Fortas in 1938 from the field. I feel most worst because after all my years of theoretical training, I haven't acquired a technique for dealing adequately, let alone analyzing the ordinary day-to-day -day activities that make up social life. Simple description is facile. Um, and so what he does in this chapter is he argues that fieldwork can be objective if based on careful detailed observations and verified and cross-checked against other sources such as newspapers or official documents. Uh, he believes that scholarly objectivity can be achieved by careful observation. He also says you should read it against the grain. And I think if you hear about the seminars at Manchester, I think this is the legacy, this idea that you should challenge what people say and read it against the grain in order that the truth could emerge. Um, history was also important to Max. I mean, hey, this guy was a bibliophile. So you can see where he's reacting to Malinowski. And in fact, I don't think he got on well with Malinowski. Uh, he talks about, the, he refers to <laughs> Malinowski as the legendary field worker in his correspondence with Fortas. But what you've got to bear in mind is in 1932, Malinowski writes an article in favor of the color bar, the case for an effective color bar. And Max, coming from South Africa, where he'd been groomed in this liberal tradition of the common society, this must have stuck in his craw like nothing on earth, this idea that you should have a color bar. And in fact, his whole student political activism was aimed at the common society in a very good liberal tradition. Oh, my God. OK. <laughs> um, anyway, what he does do in this I, I, I'm intrigued at how self-reflective it is. He, call, he says, I'm my own guinea pig. Um, he's sort of proto-Goffman in his definition of the situation. Uh, he says, whites classify, uh, Zulu classify whites into the English oppressive words grasping Jews and Germans, and they don't know how to classify him, and he's got a long thing about that. And he says, eventually, they classified him as related to British royalty. And so they dealt with him in that way. Um, he also believe, he says that the Zulu believed that they were involved in an unfair exchange with him, uh, that the Zulu were benefiting from his, ex his relationship with them rather than him with them. And this made them very suspicious. And they wanted to know why was he doing this? Why was there this non, why, what was Gluckman benefiting from field work? And they had various theories about that which I don't have time to go into. Um, and they, he points out how he was being manipulated by the Zulu. They would tell him favors and whatnot. Uh, he's also surprisingly empathetic towards the regent, pointing out that he was caught in a dilemma, that he had all these countervailing forces. Uh, but the point was, reading this, he clearly enjoyed field work. And he thanks several people in the manuscript uh, they may have regarded me as a spy, but I have written here is the truth, which is what I was searching for. All the Zulu and all situations were his informants. Casual conversations overheard, reports of returned labor migrants, law cases, political debates, in short, observed, all observed behavior provided the most of my data. Um, nevertheless, the flogging incident plays a central role. I just want to very briefly point out um, 
another interesting thing about Max. In 1937, he gives evidence to the Native Farm Labor Commission. And these Afrikaner politicians put him down. I mean, he's a snotty English Jew. And he starts off by quoting an Afrikaner saying, you don't need to eat a rotten egg to know it's bad. And then he goes in, but he's very interesting because I think in this case he precedes Evans Pritchard's famous argument. Uh, here's what he says. Even if the natives are incorrect in thinking that most farmers treat their servants badly, while only a few farmers, as the natives readily admit, treat their servants well, nevertheless it is important to remember that this native opinion is a social belief undoubtedly affects the supply of labor. Actual relationships between farmers and natives take place between individuals so that even if a particular native will be convinced that a particular farmer is a good master, the beliefs of other natives about that farmer remain unaffected. It is in many ways irrelevant whether or not the farm laborer is badly treated on the whole he is. Ne nevertheless, why should the farmer, farm native hesitate to return from a labor center to his farm? Um, since I'm running out of time, I read the unwritten archive as well as the written versions of what happens. And very briefly, I suggest that anti-Semitism played a crucial role. Um, when um, Hernley writes to the Secretary for Native Affairs, she means, oh, and Gluckman is now married. Uh, you'll recall that Michene said, oh, he's asking embarrassing questions. Um, What is important too is, and people don't appreciate this, is the tremendous amount of anti-Semitism which was raging during this period. And it wasn't just Afrikaners. Um, in fact, you know, a cash register was known as, what was it, as Jewish. <laughs> Piano was a cash register. Uh, the worst swear word in those days in South Africa wasn't fornicator of mother, it was you are an illegitimate son of a Jew. And Max, unfortunately or fortunately, he had just broken up with a lovely lady called Doreen. He was in psychoanalysis. And he was told to get away from Doreen. So what Max started doing is writing love poetry to a white teacher in Zululand. And I happened to pick this up because I know the son of the teacher. And apparently this in this small gossip society, this played a very important role in getting him booted out. So I would suggest that he got booted out. And then what happened is he met Mary. Time's up. Mm -hmm. Oh, God. Okay. <laughs> Can I have three minutes? Uh, um, Hernley and the <coughs> liberals believed to have a softy, softy policy towards the administration. Uh, Mary came in and said, listen, you've got to call a spade a spade. He knew he couldn't go back, and that's how he managed to bring the officials into his analysis. So I'll stop there. I'll be, I'll be quite brief, I think. Um, <clears throat> I first uh, uh, met Max in 1963 uh, when I'd just gone to, to do my, my PhD research uh, in Zambia uh, and uh, I confronted this. At that time I'd also learned that I was about to uh, go to Manchester to take up a, a job there and I confronted Max for the first time. And, I then knew him as this towering uh, person, uh, very, uh, very, very dominant. Uh, and he said, oh, so you're Bruce Capra, you're far too young, he said, and then turned away. <laughs> uh, uh, at that time, uh, he was absolutely uh, um, massed by uh, a large number of uh, people from Barotsiland who had come to witness the man who had worked among them 17 years before and from which land he'd been barred from going back to for that 17 years uh, because of his, so it was said, his 
communist associations and he was a subversive person. And he was surrounded by, I remember, and, and, uh, people like Nalumino Mundia and Simon Kapwepi, who were then in the New Zambian government. Uh, and they all tested him for his silozi. And they all came away with how impressed they were with his capacity with their own language. They were, in, in fact, deep admiration uh, of him. I'll go through a little bit uh, the history of the Rhodes Livingston Institute which I think was the core of what became uh, known as the Manchester School, and consider it in relationship to some of the uh, aspects of it that I think uh, contributed to its very creative moment uh, uh, in anthropology. I might say, uh, following uh, Rob Gordon, uh, that what was distinctive about Max's anthropology and largely because of the community of scholars and critics that he was part of uh, in South Africa uh, was that he was aware that uh, any group of people that anthropologists studied were part of a wider global system. He, was in, he continually emphasized the importance of any anthropologist to look at the particular groups of people that they, were, that, that, that they were studying in terms of the larger forces which were acting uh, upon them. Uh, it's this aspect which I think uh, distinguished his anthropology from much, an from much anthropology which was beginning at that time, which tended to look at peoples as isolated and as, homo as, and as homogeneous and separated from the larger global processes that were at work. Max was very much for emphasizing these larger global processes and also emphasizing that the communities that, uh, that, they, that anthropologists were studying were not necessarily homogeneous, perfectly integrated uh, societies. He was concerned with the way in which they were internally uh, fractionalized and divided up and linked into other groups of people around them. In, in a sense, this anti uh, anti-homogeneous society, the idea that no society is thoroughly isolated from larger processes, is really the hallmark of much of the anthropology that, anthrop that uh, Max Gluckman started and which is the distinction of his approach. Now, <coughs> he was appointed uh, so, uh, senior sociologist uh, in the Rose Livingston Institute uh, in, I think, something like 1938. Uh, at the time when uh, Godfrey Wilson uh, took over the uh, um, directorship of the institute, which was then located uh, near where uh, the Victoria Falls is presently and ever will be located. Um, <coughs> here, uh, here he, they, uh, they, the, 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 the institute was located until around about uh, 1950. Uh, Godfrey Wilson... Uh, was uh, certainly very left-leaning, educated in Oxford, very influential on the ideas that Max Gluckman would take, but was a conscientious objector uh, during the uh, First World War, and as a result of a lot of uh, spite uh, from the local white population uh, in, 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 uh, in, in Zambia, uh, I think, uh, and, and in fact he was very much criticised for being uh, a bad influence upon the local African population, uh, he resigned. And, it was, and uh, actually to take up a, a job as an ambulance driver uh, in North Africa, he was later to commit suicide, however, partly because of his conscientious objector uh, views it related to his own personal situation. But Max, uh, after some uh, difficulty, was uh, appointed um, as uh, the successor of Godfrey Wilson. And um, uh, he then began to uh, extend Godfrey Wilson's interests. So Godfrey Wilson had been very interested in urbanization, social change, and made it his central interest. And this fitted in with certain aspects of Max Gluckman's own liberal and uh, expansive vision of things, and Max Gluckman, in, in a sense, extended certain dimensions of Godfrey Wilson's work and uh, subjected it to some critique. A hallmark of Max's whole approach was to continually uh, subject all work in anthropology and outside it 
too intensive uh, uh, critique. It was part of his uh, uh, intellectual scientific position for, for anthropology, which I will talk about uh, later on. It was Max, for example, that, in, that uh, really set off uh, a whole tradition that he supported of systematic reanalysis of other anthropologists' work and uh, subjecting it to critical reinterpretation. Uh, a, a, an intellectual line which was to win him uh, a lot of uh, uh, upset colleagues uh, in England and elsewhere. Uh, <coughs> Max really gets the uh, uh, RLI, the Rose Things Institute, going uh, immediately after the uh, uh, Second World War in 1946 uh, and his uh, main staff at that time are uh, famous people, I think, in the history of the Institute. Max Malwick, Elizabeth Colson, who's still alive and now living permanently, I hear, in Tongaland in southern Zambia. Uh, she's over 90. Uh, and she was a major influence upon Max Gluckman's development and thought. John Barnes, who's recently died, and Clyde Mitchell also was very important, as was uh, Hans Holliman and Phyllis Dean. These were the people that actually established the groundwork uh, of, uh, of uh, the development of, uh, of uh, anthropology out of the RLI team. Now, I should mention that Max, along with, God with, along with Godfrey Wilson, was concerned that anthropology should not just be an abstract intellectual discipline, that it should have uh, pragmatic use uh, for the things that it studied and relevance, indeed, for the administration. And a lot of the early history of the RLI is about Max and uh, uh, Godfrey Wilson working in some kind of, of combination uh, with uh, colonial authorities, but in the interests uh, of the uh, local population. But it's also part of the intellectual uh, understanding that Max Gluckman had, that you had to look at the way in which different systems intersected and the complexities of their, of their intersection, uh, which was uh, a hallmark of some of his work. There's a very famous article uh, about uh, uh, the, the village headman, which he writes uh, with some of the first people that were working with him in the field uh, in, 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 northern Rhodesia, in northern Rhodesia or Zambia with John Barnes and Clyde uh, Mitchell called the village headman in British Central Africa, which is... Uh, it was a term that really confused me when I first came across it because it was about the intercalary position of African village headmen, how they were occupying uh, different roles in the white governed in, 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 the, in the white colonial uh, organization at the same time uh, had to represent their own people. He was, they, they were interested in the complexities of this kind of positionality uh, at a section between often a contradictory uh, systems. Uh, the whole idea of the Rhodes Living Institute was to, to, to conceive of the anthropological work, which wasn't simply done by anthropologists. What is interesting about Max is that he was concerned uh, with not just anthropology, but with other disciplines and the interrelation of these <coughs> other disciplines in work. He was interested in bringing in, in, in historians, working with agriculturalists, uh, working with ecologists that would be, would be called now and so on. He was interested in anthropology actually being aware of the kinds of insights that other disciplines had. Uh, when the institute was first established in, uh, in, in Livingston, uh, uh, he was concerned that uh, anthropologists should study carefully the material culture of the populations that they were going to study. He wasn't simply interested in an anthropology that was concerned with social relations. He was interested in the forms of symbolic representations that these people, uh, in fact, uh, had around them and the way in which they thought about their situation. The important thing is he saw uh, uh, Central Africa uh, as a laboratory for anthropological research. Here were different uh, peoples, different principles uh, organizing their social and political life uh, coming into different types of relations. So he encouraged, for example, uh, Clyde Mitchell, who was to become important in the later development 
of the Rose Lytics Institute to study the Yao in uh, Nyasaland or Malawi as it is now, uh, and to study them because this was a, a particular matrilineal society. He was interested in the structure of matrilineal principles uh, and, and, and how uh, that society was affected by uh, its uh, Islamic commitment. Uh, in fact, uh, his interest in Audie Richards and about the whole massive work that, uh, in fact, I was involved in it at one point, was to have a look at, at the sort of issues that emerged with Malinowski, the nature of matrilineal kinship and the so-called matrilineal puzzle, uh, the, the way in which political authority could go to males, for example, even though succession was down the female line. He was interested in the complexities of that and the contradictions in that. And he was interested in testing uh, certain arguments that were then coming out of the Malinovskian uh, sphere of things in the context of, uh, of, of uh, Central Africa. Uh, I just want to mention that not as, as well as not being, interested, not being interested in societies as homogeneous entities, in a sense, if you were to place him in, in a modern, uh, in, in, a, in a sort of jargon of, 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 uh, of post-modernity, Max was interested in hybrid forms, the way in which different types of <coughs> processes meshed uh, with each other. Anyhow, the first uh, establishment of the, of the RLI is, uh, um, through, uh, is, is, is from 1946. That's the second main uh, cohort uh, of researchers and they're under the control of uh, Max Gluckman uh, in close association with Elizabeth Colson. He had a very close emotional relationship I think, with Elizabeth, and, and that uh, uh, continued throughout the history of the Rose Livingston Institute. Yeah, uh <coughs> Anyhow, it's, it's John Barnes, Clyde Mitchell, Elizabeth Colson, Max Marvick, who are the main figures in the early establishment uh, of, the, of the Rose Livingston Institute. Uh, they're, they're joined uh, uh, later on uh, by a uh, second group, uh, 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 Represented by uh, famous people, I think, uh, Ian Cunnison, uh, Victor Turner, uh, Yarp Van Velsen, uh, and, and Bill Watson. Uh, one point I want to emphasize in relationship to the creative energy of the Rose Limps Institute itself, not just the, the context in which it was located. Here are 72 different languages being spoken. Here are certain forms of political authority of a patrilineal kind as against a matrilineal kind. There are uh, people without uh, uh, centralized systems and so on. There's a whole mass of different types of, of social and cultural order which, which, which uh, provides the fascination for the kinds of work uh, which, uh, uh, which uh, develops. Uh, but what I want to emphasise is the is the anthropologist that he that he that he that he got around him. Uh, here is, I think, a man with, uh, as, as Rob was saying, a man of uh, uh, extraordinary intellect and massive reading, um, uh, that uh, uh, got around him um, uh, a group of young people who had just come out of the Second World War. Uh, I think John Barnes, I may be wrong on this, was uh, a bomber pilot. Uh, 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 Bill Watson was a fighter pilot. Uh, 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 Clyde Mitchell was a navigator flying over Yugoslavia, dropping uh, supplies to the partisans. These were all people, young, young people, uh, who were moving into uh, their postgraduate work, who'd already established their identity and their confidence uh, in, in, in the world. In fact, that often jibed Max about the fact that he, that he was fighting in Barotsiland while they were doing the real stuff uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Europe. Uh, but I think it was this kind of challenge that these young men presented to Max which forced Max into, into even greater production of his, intellect, of his intellectual capacity. The way he could control them and dominate them in a sense, in, in sort of direct their uh, ideas and so forth, was intellectually. And it was their presence, they were all differently trained, some in psychology, some in social administration, uh, or welfare, uh, um, 
John Barnes was a mathematician before he decided to move into anthropology. They had different types of framework. Uh, and uh, as well as their own sense of autonomy, uh, you know, they were, they, they were able to, in a sense, uh, challenge Max. And this, I think, produced uh, a tremendous development in Max himself, uh, intellectually. Uh, and he was able to, I think, impress all, all the people I talked to with the uh, extraordinary development of his uh, intellectual grasp of things at the time. Four minutes, please. How much? Four. Oh, gosh. Uh, okay, um, let me just make some quick points. The seminars, the seminars are really, are really important. I understand, uh, at least Clive Mitchell told me that the first seminar they ever had was when uh, uh, the Rhodes Livingston Institute was located in Livingston before it moved to Lusaka, which would have been in around about 1950 under the directorship of Liz Colson. Uh, Max had by then gone uh, to take up a chair in Manchester. Uh, the first seminar I've heard was uh, in, the, uh, in the Zambezi River uh, with Max getting his hair cut at the same time. Uh, this is sort of this wonderful feeling that, 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 that uh, uh, Max was a, a, a completely all-round personality and extremely eccentric and, uh, uh, and, and thoroughly enjoyable uh, through it. But the seminars were for Max scientific occasions. They were occasions when everything was open to challenge, even the fieldwork material that you yourself had collected. In fact, you were to be separated from what you thought you saw. So the criticism was often savage, uh, and, and uh, uh, as well as intending to, in a sense, get a community of people participating in the creation of your ideas, this egalitarian aspect of Max, the idea that people should participate with each other in producing ideas was something which he really developed and he used the seminar to do that. I think the seminar for him was the real occasion, the real hard scientific work in which you yourself was challenged, was, was, was challenged about the authenticity uh, of your approaches. I know Myself and many others were forced to go up on the blackboard and draw genealogies just to prove that we knew what these uh, kinship relations and so forth were, and which gave Max a chance to reanalyze what the, what the situation was and to come out with something a little different uh, from us. I should emphasize that I think uh, the um, uh, semin the uh, intellectual development of the, uh, of, of, the, of the RLI, which has many of, of, of the major concepts that are now, social network analysis, concepts of arena uh, and, and, and field, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, severe attack on any kind of evolutionism uh, in, uh, in anthropological thought and so forth, all that is very much part uh, of the, of the uh, um, uh, Manchester position. I emphasise the, 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 the sort of powerful emphasis upon scientific work. Um, everyone, at the, all the uh, first lot, the, first, the, the, first, the, the second two cohorts, that is uh, Epstein, uh, Epstein uh, Watson, um, uh, Van Velsen, Victor Turner, all these people had to deposit their, their field notes in the library at the Rose Livingston Institute. These were to be available to all researchers coming in. They forced the researchers to document carefully their material. At the same time, it opened their material to the inspection of others. There was a, a, a real uh, emphasis that uh, uh, people had to collect material which was able to be validated uh, from a number of different directions. Uh, so, uh, I, can, uh, I, I probably should stop there. But it's also the interaction between uh, Ma Manchester uh, run by Max and the RLI. The fact that the RLI was actually the field station for uh, the testing of many and the collection of the material which were then further investigated uh, in the context uh, of the Manchester department. I haven't, I've met, left out other contexts. I'll just close off on a point that I think is important to understand the creativity of that Manchester period from about, uh, I think roughly from about uh, 1941 to about 1956, <coughs> 1958, a high point of the, uh, of the RLI. Um, what is important, I think, is 
Max as as a marginal, as as far as uh, as far he was taking, he was a, a centre of marginal thinkers. Other Jews from South Africa, colonials, uh, working class, and so forth. Manchester was a, 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 a sort of cauldron at the edge uh, of. Uh, of sort of hierarchical official England. In many ways, the relationships between Manchester, LSE, uh, Oxford, and Cambridge, the tensions between them are part of the creative moment of the RLI itself and of the Manchester School. Uh, I can go on for quite a bit longer, uh, but uh, 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 I think that it, it is a, a period which not only had the energy of Max, but the energy of Max was further generated within this uh, context of Southern Africa uh, and of the actual intellectual and academic situation in England at, at the time. Um, <coughs> so I'll, I'll, yes, I'll close off there. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. So in a reminiscent mode, I met Max in 1966. I was studying at the University of Pittsburgh doing a doctorate there in anthropology and uh, Max was visiting at Yale University where he was giving the Storrs lectures in jurisprudence. And we went out for a walk, pleasant day, towered over me indeed, uh, and asked me about myself, my interest in anthropology and so on. And I had spent some time with a uh, Washoe shaman in, uh, in uh, Nevada, and I waxed eloquently about that and uh, about the impact that that man was having on my own worldview, in, in a way, uh, on my own intellectual development. And he stopped me, glowered down at me, and said there was no hint of a smile on his face, we will have to retrain you. <laughs> and I said to myself, Don, what are you getting yourself into? But that's another story. <laughs> what I want to do here is talk about Max Gluckman's idea of structural duration. Uh, let me begin with a word from Ilya Prigozhin, who was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1977. <coughs> for his studies of thermodynamic systems far from equilibrium. Prigozhin says somewhere, I think it may be in the popular book that he wrote with uh, the historian of science, Isabel Stenger's Order Out of Chaos, he says something like the following, and it sounds utterly banal. He says, everything in the universe exists through time, nothing exists outside of time. But to this he adds, yet everything exists through its own time. Everything, whether a stone or a star or a comet, exists through the time which is particular to its own being, to its own particular constitution in the cosmos. Everything exists through temporality, which is particular to its own composition. Uh, its own, perhaps, internal integrity, the self-integrity which makes it what it is. In 1966, Max, who was about 55 years old at the time, was invited to give a plenary address to the American Anthropological Association. And this, I think, was a highlight of his illustrious career, since it marked the recognition of his accomplishments beyond the sphere of influence of British social anthropology. A second plenary lecture was given by the social anthropologist Frederick Barth, then about 38 years old, uh, who had founded the Department of Social Anthropology at the University of Bergen uh, a few years before, and who had worked with Edmund Leach at Cambridge and who for over a decade had dazzled anthropology with his sophisticated bringing together and modeling of culture, social organization, transactionalism, and individual agency. 
Barth lectured on the study of social change as the outgrowth of the cumulative strategic choices persons made vis-a-vis -vis one another. Gluckman also lectured on the study of social change, relating this to what he called the utility of the equilibrium model in the study of institutions undergoing change. Max's lecture received polite applause. Barth's lecture received a standing ovation. The reactions of the audience clearly communicated that Barth was at the cutting edge of anthropology, addressing agency and decision making in everyday life, while Max was a passé structural functionalist, a brontosaurus who insisted on holding onto outmoded theoretical ideas of systemic equilibrium. And Max Gluckman returned then to Manchester, where I was at the time, in very deep gloom. But there is something intriguing in this rejection of Gluckman's presentation. Despite his defense of the equilibrium model as a heuristic device with which to compare and contrast change through time, there is a fascinating idea embedded in the lecture, which, when applied to the sociocultural, recalls Prigozhin's comment on time with which I began. And this is the idea which Max called the structural duration of institutions. An idea, I think, utterly ignored and forgotten, tangled up in the equilibrium model and caught in the misidentification of Gluckman with structural functionalism. Google Gluckman and structural duration and you will come up with hardly a bare handful of references. Well, what is the idea of structural dura duration? I prefer to drop the connection that Max made between structural duration and institution and talk instead of organization or a phenomenon or of an assemblage that seems to hold together through time and that may even seem to produce cultural time through its own self-integrity. Luckman is saying, like Prigozhin, that no phenomena exist outside of time, and so that every phenomenon existing in the human world has its own time scale, as he put it, built into it. And moreover, moreover that we cannot understand a phenomenon, an organization, unless we do so in that very scale." Unquote. The particular time scale of a phenomenon is the structural duration of that phenomenon. The time scale is the period through which the phenomenon lives fully so that one can perceive, perhaps even understand, the entirety of its existence. No phenomenon, no assemblage, whether tiny or huge, exists in such a simple manner that one can see its existence in the temporal flatness of the immediate present. Yet neither can we assign arbitrarily a period of time which we will declare as sufficient time to know the phenomenon or the assemblage through time. One must discover the structural duration through which a phenomenon may be said to exist fully in itself in order to describe its assemblage, in order to describe its connections and implications as itself, as its self-integrity which enables its phenomenal existence. How can one know in a fuller sense the length and complexity of a structural duration? How can one know whether an organization or an assemblage might be cyclical, might be oscillatory, might be periodic, or indeed might be open-ended. In the best of ethnographic worlds, we do this by living and following what seems to be the phenomenon or the assemblage, thereby learning what happens in what seems to be the nature of the organization, and so in relation to other assemblages. In fact, one cannot know the structural duration without following what seems to be 
what is assumed to be an organization or assemblage, yet without knowing whether this is indeed the case. And without comprehending its structural duration, one will not know in the fuller sense the nature of the phenomenon and how it changes or doesn't change. <coughs> in discussing structural duration, Gluckman was not referring to historical time in the usual sense, but rather to time that is integral to a phenomenon, the time that enables the phenomenon to be or to become fully itself, the time to go through the alterations or changes that make it as it is, that only can be witnessed through time and that constitutes the cultural and social fullness of that phenomenon. Structural duration indexes organization through the temporality of its own interior dynamics. This enables us to comprehend how assemblages and phenomena are constituted through their own temporalities, their own tempos, their own rhythms, their own disturbances, their own equilibrations, their own chaotics. On reflection, there is no shortage of examples of structural duration in the anthropological literature. And here are just a few uh, minor examples that uh, came to mind as I, was, uh, as I was thinking about this. In her study of family, community, and industry in an American town, the anthropologist June Nash concludes that the researcher needs to account for four generations of family in order to see the biological processes of mating, reproduction, maturity, and death worked out in a complete cycle. And you must have the complete cycle. She had to have the complete cycle in order to understand what a generation was, changes from generation to generation, and so forth. This is not something she could decide beforehand. She had to see it happening in operation. <coughs> in his excellent book, uh, Fluid Signs, Being a Person the Tamil Way, the anthropologist Valentine Daniels discovered unexpectedly that in participating in his, I think it was his third pilgrimage, but it may have been his fifth pilgrimage, to the shrine of a particular deity, in doing what he thought of as a repetitive ethnographic learning experience, he was actually completing the full cycle of pilgrimage, which was expected of the pilgrim who had entered fully into the world of that, uh, of that deity. Uh, this was the, he had achieved the critical mass of devotional value and meaning for the devotee in relation to this deity, and yet it happened accidentally. In her book, Inuit Morality Play, Jean Briggs watched numerous episodes of adults trying to play with a three-year-old Inuit in ways that Jean herself came to think of as failed attempts at game playing only to discover that the Inuit game actually ends just when we would expect it to begin. And so Jean was looking entirely at the wrong duration of the phenomenon. But again, she discovered this through the process of observation, and in that sense, discovered it accidentally. But nonetheless, the full structural duration was extremely recognizing it, identifying it, and going through it was critical to understanding the cultural social phenomenon. Okay. <coughs> My own sense is that Gluckman did not fully appreciate the significance of his own idea of structural duration. Perhaps he was discouraged by the cool response that he received at the American Anthropological Association, and he just let the idea be. He had many other ideas and lots to think about. He argued in relation to structural duration that, quote, whenever we attempt to analyze an institution, 
we have to throw it into its structural duration since all social life is a process in time. This involves analyzing the institution as if it were operating through a far longer period than the actual period during which we observe it or its parts, unquote. But the formulation of his here of as if, the as if of an imaginary projection of the present into the future turns duration flat. A time one that is the present, which is projected, to a time two, which is the future, one flat slice of time followed by a second flat slice of time, a kind of CT scan of the social. <coughs> Gluckman treated structural duration as a kind of skeleton of time. Yet the fuller significance of structural duration is that the entirety of the phenomenon is always dynamic, always in movement, and in this sense, there is no fro frozen slice of time too, since present is continuously becoming future. This perspective is one that I have called prospective history. Prospective history begins with presentness, always moving into the future. Prospective history is a history of becoming. The prospective attitude to history is most involved with social practice, which was so critical to Manchester anthropology. Since it is social practice that creates futures, one goes forward following the emergence, following the development of, in this case, the practices constituting the structural duration in the present. Unfolding, reproductive, haphazard, chaotic, as these prospectively become futurities. The fuller significance of structural duration is that it is profoundly full. Call this fuller significance, say, a duration of form that simultaneously occupies multiple dimensions through which people potentially move, in the form, through the form, with the form, changing the form. Structural duration as a duration of form exists simultaneously in multiple dimensions. People are simultaneously within pastness, presentness, and futureness in whatever form the structural duration is composed of. If anyone here thinks of themselves as influenced by phenomenology, then they should recognize in Max's idea of structural duration a dynamic, temporal, phenomenal form with its own self-integrity, whose basis likely is cultural. A temporal form which enables people potentially to move through time in certain ways rather than others and with certain consequences. Max, who at times described himself as a sociological anthropologist, missed the significance of the fullness of structural duration because he failed to recognize just how culturally formed such phenomena are. But you can also take this little exposition as a case study of how fertile ideas, even those of great scholars, are lost in the academic shuffle. Ten minutes off the break anyway, so we can take another five minutes off for questions and comments. Bakasha. I wasn't a structural functionalist and therefore I couldn't possibly come to Manchester. To 
because it was a few years after his debacle in America and he was losing control over British anthropology. In the end, <coughs> I went to Sussex and did a defil there. But Max Glutman came back to haunt me because in the end, my supervisor was Bill Epstein from the Rose Livingston <laughs> Institute. And in my first conversation with Bill, I said, but you understand that I left the Malinowski room and I was trained in Marxist anthropology and I won't be a structural functionist. And he tapped me on the back in a very paternal manner and said, of course, we understand, and then went on to supervise me. I just want to um, end up with telling you that um, Professor Gordon has mentioned that he was a bibliophile, but he was also a human being. And when I found, when I was living amongst the Indian Jews in Israel for my field work, I was embarrassed to write to Bill Epstein and tell him that I was pregnant. It was the days when people didn't have children and certainly not anthropologists. And so I wrote to him in long hand and said, I'm sorry, I'm pregnant. And he wrote back saying, as my supervisor said to me, Max Gluckman, babies are better than books. <laughs> No questions and we are eager to have a break so we'll reconvene at half past five please.